This is a Momentum Media production. Australian Aviation Podcast. The official podcast of Australian Aviation. Unpacking the latest insights, developments and issues impacting Australia's aviation sector. Hello everybody, I'm Adam Thorne and welcome to the Australian Aviation Podcast and Happy New Year! Happy New Year, but not so happy for some as it transpires the COVID nightmare is still rumbling on. We've got a new year, a new variant causing uh, trouble, but before we get to all that doom and gloom, on a more upbeat note, I will introduce my co-host Hannah Dowling. Hannah, how are you? Good, Adam. How are you? I'm doing very well. What's going on in Queensland up there, up north? Oh, it's gone a bit, it's gone a bit bonkers here. We managed to survive most of the pandemic without a major outbreak. And then of course, as everybody knows, the whole country's just opened up and it's spread like wildfire. So yep, narrowly trying to avoid any encounter with Miss Rona at the moment, but we'll see how long those, those efforts last. In a pantheon of things I would be worried about living in Queensland, like I've got your crocodiles, mm-hmm. snakes, spiders, like the Rona is is down my list of things that could get you. <laughs> but I it's mean, just another thing on the list now to, to be mindful of everywhere I go. Obviously, obviously the kangaroos and the crocodiles that I encounter on a daily basis are, will continue to be top priority, but it's just another thing, isn't it? It is just another thing. We've not even got into the birds, the most appalling thing in Australia. Literally all of them will try to kill you. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, the these... magpies up here are on steroids. <laughs> I, bet they, I bet they're just angry, angry they really country, are. angry state. Everything's trying to get you. I should say a little bit of a call out to Bella Richards, uh, one of our aerospace reporters, who's currently down with the Rona. She is currently at home resting up. Get well soon, Bella. But... We both currently are COVID negative, so we will plough on and give you the news. So we've had a new year, and this was meant to be a fresh new start, everything kind of back to normal. We were seeing, you know, three airlines, soon to be four, going at it in 2022. But we've had Christmas and we've had New Year have been a bit of a disaster because we've got this this almost triple threat. We've got um, uh, people that obviously aren't, we, we've got an underlying pilot shortage. We've got an underlying shortage of people. We've got people isolating because they've got COVID. So they're therefore not booking flights or they're, you know, getting flight credits. And then obviously we've got people in the industry as well who are isolating, which is causing all sorts of cancellations. It sounds like carnage. Hannah, tell us a bit more. It absolutely is carnage. So what we saw earlier this week, Virgin Australia announced that it will slash its flight capacity for both January and February at this point in time by 25%, exactly just due to to what you mentioned there, staff shortages, people being sent into isolation in droves, people actually catching coronavirus and, and unfortunately having to, you know, tend to that, being unwell and, again, having to isolate. It just compacts into this huge problem. It obviously isn't just aviation that is experiencing these problems. We're seeing it through other sort of transport industries. You may have noticed your supermarket shelves looking a little bit bare. That's all down to the same problems that is just going right across the country at the moment. It's also led to a whole bunch of flight cancellations. Virgin, Qantas, Jetstar, everybody is having to do it. Virgin, as I said, made an announcement earlier this week, a more official sort of statement to say that this is what's going on and this is why. They've cancelled all flights across 10 of their sort of least performing routes, I suppose. A lot of Adelaide routes, a lot of Townsville routes have been cancelled altogether. So unfortunately, anybody who's booked on those flights will need to make other arrangements. But it is sort of spreading across the industry. I think Virgin's been the most vocal about it at this point. But even this morning, we saw what was it, Adam, 80 flights at Sydney Airport being cancelled just today, just on, we're recording this Tuesday, 11th of January, in Sydney Airport alone, just due to staff shortages, isolation, crisis. It's all going on. It's all happening. 
Yeah, and the most interesting thing is we've had Virgin come out on Monday and kind of formally announce they're going to kind of really uh, significantly strip back their service, cancelling some uh, routes and, and reducing the kind of capacity. We've not had a similar announcement as yet from Qantas and Jetstar, but having a look through the cancellations today on Flight Radar, it seems that they are cancelling almost as many flights, probably more, uh, almost certainly the vast majority of them for the same reason. You've got to have a huge amount of sympathy for airlines because you know what can they do they're being stung always one you've got this idea that obviously a lot of the staff are having to isolate either they've got it or they live with someone that does have it but you've also got the fact that the whole country or all the major cities seem eerily quiet everyone is staying home nobody is traveling everybody is cancelling their plans you you feel for them because what more can they do they don't really have a choice do they yeah that's absolutely right i don't think that You know, I would say a lot of the airlines felt like they were through the worst of it at this point, which is possibly the most heartbreaking part of it is that, and I think we all did, we all thought once lockdowns were over, we were all going to move on and we were all going to, you know, get back to somewhat of a normal life again. But unfortunately, with this new variant, with this new outbreak and, you know, just because we're not necessarily in any sort of formal lockdown I would say vast majority of the people I know personally are currently in isolation, were in isolation over Christmas due to either having COVID or living with someone who did, you know, and that puts a stop to many people's travel plans as well. And then, of course, obviously staff who are impacted by it. It's a huge blow to an industry that's already suffered so many problems and challenges over the last 18 months to two years. But hopefully, you know, things are changing. We saw, you know, both state and federal governments this week making new announcements to try and ease a little bit of that burden, changing sort of close contact isolation rules, you know, so that aviation workers who don't have symptoms, who might have been exposed to COVID, don't actually have to isolate until they do show symptoms. Things like this to hopefully ease a little bit of that burden. But it is, it's a tough time for airlines. And I do, I personally have a lot of respect for Virgin and for Jane Hardlicker getting a sort of a front foot on that notion because we can all see it happening. We know it's going on. But to sort of come out and say, look, this is where we're at and this is what we're doing, whereas, you know, Qantas taking a little bit of a different route and uh, doing it a little bit more behind closed doors and and just cancelling flights without sort of saying anything formal you know, obviously different approaches, but I do I do sort of commend Virgin for how they've tackled it. It also feels that the country as a whole has kind of been changing its strategy. So we have this kind of shambolic situation at Christmas, particularly in Queensland, where, where you are, mm-hmm. and um, where they were, were insisting on having PCR tests and they yeah. had a PCR test in order to enter the state. And then this, oh, I don't care, this absurd idea that you had to have a PCR test after day five as well after you arrived. And obviously, as we had the Omicron variant kind of uh, rip through the uh, the country, you had these absurd queues. So we ran one story, I don't know if it was Boxing Day or the day after, uh, somebody called Liam Garman, who you may be aware of, who's the editor of our defence titles here at Momentum Media, which uh, owns Australian Aviation. Um, he went um, and has spent his Christmas in Brisbane and he was worried, like a lot of people were, whether he'd get his negative result so that he could board the flight to Queensland. And then he was one of the people queuing for these day five tests. And he was queuing from five o'clock in the morning and they were like in the car. And he was sending me pictures of these queues going back, you know, as far as the eye can see at 5 a.m. in the morning. And he was basically told, because he had to go from one testing site to another testing site to another testing site, and he was basically told it would take seven hours for him to even get the test long before you'd even get the result back. And very luckily, I like to think it was Australian Aviation what did it. We ran a story and said, look at these queues on the day five test, and would you believe it, six or seven hours later, the powers that be shaken by the long arm of Australian aviation, they took away the day five tech requirement. So you're all Look welcome for that. that. You're that all is, welcome. That is public service journalism. Yeah, it is public right service there. journalism. A lot of people say, what do you do over Christmas? I, I do not stop. I'm here to fight for the industry. I'm here to fight for every single traveller. That's what we do. It's what oh. we do here. Don't stop. That's what, what a we legend. do. <laughs> oh, I've done it again. I'm like, but no, yeah. so you, you have this absurd situation where we have these PCR tests, which are very expensive and very time consuming, and people have to be trained to do them, et cetera, et cetera, which for some states were the only tests they would accept. So then we have that, and we then sensibly 
as a country, shifted towards these rapid antigen tests. That they, that for some, they don't call them as any rats in the world. In Australia, we call them the rats. Have you go and get a rat? <laughs> is that not um, a thing everywhere else? No, no, no. Nobody <laughs> else is like, you. Yeah, let's call them the rats. That's just a purely Australian thing. They just call them the, the antigen test or the lateral flow test. Anyway, uh, so we've switched cool. towards these over-the-counter rapid antigen tests. If you the can find with, them. Exactly. So this is the other <laughs> issue. So they've gone, we're going for these over-the-counter ones. Turns out we haven't got any right now. So they are, to be fair, the federal governments and state governments have bought millions and millions and millions of them, and they are flying them in. But obviously, that's all taking time. You've then got the problem. People can't find the tests. Do you, if you know, there's people who are clearly have the Omicron who can't get a test, who don't want to line up in a PCR queue, which is totally sensible. If you think you've got it, you don't want to give it to other people and be waiting for hours who mm. are now not Or if being you're not counters. feeling your best, if you've got, you know, if you've got, you know, uh, flu and, and fever symptoms, you know, you don't want to be sitting in your car for eight hours of the day just trying to get a test and do the right thing. Like it sucks, but it's the way it is. Exactly. So you've got this kind of situation at the moment where we're all a little bit in flux. It has become very, very, very difficult. And I think everybody is kind of sitting and holding type and hoping that in a few weeks time this calms down now i would say that we are not on this show trained epidemiologists we have no scientific qualifications <laughs> i failed miserably my science gcse so i'm not do not take medical advice to me but it does seem that in south africa in pretoria where this started and also in london which seemed to become the kind of second epicenter of this omicron that you had this kind of rapid rise in this big spike I and mean, then it kind of fell away are always falling away almost as quickly as it started. So I think the hope is if we could get through the next few weeks, things will calm down a little bit. But nonetheless, you've got to feel for the aviation industry. They've been through the ringer. Christmas was a very significant time because we had borders opened up and there was a hope that airlines would be able to recoup some of the money that they've lost in 2020 and 2021. It's yet another thing to deal with, but there is at least hope this might be the kind of the last roar of COVID. This might hopefully be the end game and then we can get back to normal. Yeah, he's hoping. I have heard, you know, a lot of the actual scientists, the people who know what they're talking about, you know, suggesting that it could be February or March where we'll sort of see some sort of end to this madness that's going on now. Hopefully more so February, if not a little bit earlier, where where the case numbers just start to, to come down a little bit. But it has been a really, really tough time for all of the airlines. It's a nightmare sort of trying to adjust with the times because as you said, just before Christmas we saw borders opening up. Everyone was excited to get out there and travel. I actually I was down in New South Wales just before Christmas, I had a family holiday in early December. So I came back up to Queensland, I think about three days after they opened the borders. And I had to wait for that PCR test before I could go. And the line at that point was three hours, which I thought I was in country New South Wales. I was like, you know, this is ridiculous. Like nobody here gets tested. It's a bit of an anti-vax sort of center. I won't say where I was, but that's, <laughs> you might be Massive able to Massive claim to make. You're slurring. You've got to say where you were because otherwise you're slurring the whole I was, state. I was around, in and around sort of like Coffs Harbour, that area. And look, I was there at the markets on the Saturday and there was thousands of people marching saying, you know, no to the vax, don't vax my kids, all of that. It's so you fine. were on Each the anti-vax march. That's what it sounds like. Oh, no way. I was just sitting there drinking my coffee mm. Watching them all go by. But I did, I had this sort of a naive idea in my head that, oh, it won't take me that long. Like, oh, okay, all right, this afternoon I got to go get that PCR test so I can go home in two days' time. And I just sort of thought, you know, it'll take me maybe like an hour and a half. And then I got there and they're like, yeah, look, it'll be at least three hours in this line. And I was like, oh, you're kidding. But it was just because, you know, Queensland, Tasmania, everywhere was sort of having this pre travel PCR requirement. And it was, it was just, it was sort of the beginning of this nightmare that has turned into what it has today. But it's really a sort of strange to think that that was only three or four weeks ago and none of us sort of saw where it was going in that by the time we got to Christmas Eve, we were having cancelled flights, we were having, you know, airlines in disarray just because everybody was being sent into isolation, everybody had COVID, no one could travel, it was all a nightmare. So, look, it's an absolutely trying time to be in the aviation industry yet again, but here's hoping for brighter skies and better days in the next couple of months. 
can I ask when you had your PCR test? I've only yeah. ever had one during this outbreak. Yeah. They were very aggressive when they were shoving it up my nose. Now, my theory was that they see me as a pom and it's like some <laughs> kind of retribution. It's like, oh, yeah, if I can put it down there. Like, I was like choking. I'm like, this is worse than the COVID. I've heard they've got more delicate with it. What was your experience when you had the, because you'd yeah. be one of the last of the PCR tests. Yeah, 100%. I thought they were quite delicate. Mm. I had a PCR test a couple months prior. I'm trying to remember what the purpose of that one was. Oh, I just moved up to Queensland and and I someone, you know, was like, oh, you've been in Sydney, you have to get a PCR test. I was like, okay, all right, sure, go for it. But they were super aggressive. It went right up mm. and touched my brain, did not feel nice, did not enjoy <laughs> that experience. But this time around, it was actually, I could notice mm. the difference. It was a lot more gentle. The people sort of like talked me through it as well, like when they were doing it and they were like, this is, you know, what we're doing and why we're doing it. I, you know, I don't know if it's just the, the friendly Coffs Harbour, you know, nurses there, but they were great. I could not, yeah, recommend it more highly. Go, go get your PCR test. <laughs> go get your PCR. Just be careful who you've got doing it because when I had mine, there's no way they had to go down that far. I mean, it was extraordinary. <laughs> it almost went down my body and out the other end. I'm like, this is, I'm not, oh, oh. God. <laughs> um, don't let that put you off though i don't want anyone to say we didn't get their their covid test because what adam thorne yeah, i don't want that on my conscience on that note i'm gonna i'm gonna cut cut my <laughs> losses and we're gonna go to a break and Maybe when we that. come back we're gonna talk about a major change to Qantas's fleet we'll be back in a minute Okay, welcome back. So we're going to put that COVID chat to aside for one moment. And just before Christmas, I think a week or so before, Qantas made a, a, a huge announcement. And that is that essentially Qantas's narrow body fleet is vast majority, kind of 95% is 737s. I think it's a 737-800 for those of you being anal enough on the variants, but it's a 737-800. They also have a couple of Fokkers as well, and they have some smaller aircraft, but that is that they are essentially mostly a Boeing airline. Now they are coming up for kind of a fleet renewal. They're going to the point where they're going to have to slowly but surely start replacing all of these aircraft. And it was, it felt that they were kind of veering towards the max, which is what Virgin has gone for and what Bonza has gone for. But in a kind of surprise announcement, they've decided that they're going to essentially become an almost all Airbus fleet, they're going to go for the Airbus A, and I, I will explain the numbers for you because I researched this. The Airbus A220 is the smaller of the Airbus narrow buddies, and the 320s are the slightly larger. But they have put in a firm order for, I think, 20 220s and 20... 20- 320s get that right adam and that they also have the um the option to buy a lot of more and they signal they're going to be an all airbus fleet hannah talk me through the significance of this because this is actually a worldwide story this is one of the reasons that um boeing lost out to airbus globally in their 2021 orders it is quite a shift from Qantas, isn't it yeah absolutely i mean anybody who's traveled Qantas domestically over the last you know, however many years would know that it's it, 737s have been the Qantas workhorse. They've been a global workhorse for domestic travel for many, 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 many years. And it, and it is a big deal to hear that such a major airline like Qantas is shifting its attention, shifting its alliances from Boeing over to Airbus. It has been something we've seen a little bit of internationally if you over the last 18 months have read anything over on world of aviation our sister title you you might know this already but it has been a little bit of a trend where we start to see these all boeing airlines shift towards airbus i mean i i'm probably going to end up oversimplifying this a lot i'm sure there's a lot that goes on behind closed doors that we aren't actually privy to you know and joyce when he made this announcement of of the shift to to the Airbus A320s and and A220s in particular, you know, and he said, you know, everyone was so, you know, helpful during the process. Like, can I commend Airbus, Boeing and Embraer for their efforts in this process, all of this, you know, saying that it was such a close race, but ultimately Airbus won out in the end. You can't help but think so, particularly when we are talking about essentially what would be the 737 MAX, which is the next generation, the future generation of the 737 aircraft versus the A320 and A321 Neo. These are sort of the two equivalents of each other. They're more or less similar capacity. They would be domestic, you know, aircraft. This is what airlines would be comparing as a almost like for like sort of equivalency. The 737 MAX though has a lot of 
baggage to it these days. There is a lot of connotations there and I know that people will come after us because every time we talk about this, every time we write a story about this, we do get a little bit of mixed reviews from our commenters, some saying the 737 MAX is the most, you know, highly regulated aircraft in the world. It's the safest aircraft in the world because it's been through this, that and the other. It's been so heavily criticised, all of this. And then other saying, you know, I would never get on a 737 MAX myself. If it's Boeing, I'm not going. All of this sort of stuff. It's it's hilarious. It's kind of crazy, like watching it all unfold in this way. But obviously, Adam, we've talked about this on the podcast before, so I don't think it's news to anybody, but the 737 MAX had some really high profile crashes in 2018 and 2019, went through an entire recertification safety process and has now been relaunched to the market. But people are still iffy about it. They still have cold feet. And I think that the airlines really are speaking, you know, that they're speaking with their feet in this way, in that they're making decisions, big, big sort of game-changing decisions like Qantas has made here. And it seems to be that that confidence is wavering in Boeing. It's a big deal. It is a big deal. So I think you are totally correct in that when we talk about that individual aircraft, I think the FAA, which is the American equivalent of CASA, said this is now the most checked aircraft in the world. There is no safer aircraft to be. I don't think anyone necessarily doubts that. But certainly from a when we talked about this on World of Aviation, there was a lot of comments that the problems in Boeing went further than simply the MAX. And certainly the CEO of Emirates talked about how there was a, a kind of a wider cultural problem within the plane maker, which is something they very much struggled to shake off. Now, when you look at, now clearly that the plane nerds, which is us as well, we're not going to deny that, will tell you that there are substantial differences between the 737 MAX and the A320 and the A220 aircrafts, but not really. Not really, in, in, from a more general sense, in, the, in that they will be coming in at a similar price. And they're, they're, they're basically the key difference, if you're, if you're new to aviation, is the fuel efficiency. So fuel efficiency, I think it works at something like 10, 15% better than the generation that came before. That might not sound a lot, but when you're putting on thousands of flights, that's a very significant increase in the profits you can make. Also helps airlines with their green credentials. That does make a significant difference. There's also the argument that obviously these 737s that have been doing the rounds for 20 years, they're getting to the end of their lifelines. So you you have a choice and there are, you know, all sorts of uh, positives and negatives, but it comes down to the kind of the deal you can get and the kind of, you know, um, the reputation of each one. It feels that Qantas has gone from being a Boeing airline to an Airbus airline. They do have the, uh, the 787 nines, which the Dreamliners, which is mm-hmm. their kind of workhorse common a day international aircraft, but they are also almost certain to buy the A350 1000s for which will be their project Sunrise, which is going to be the flagship route for Qantas. My personal theory is that when Project Sunrise launches, that is the moment when Alan Joyce will ride into the sunset, having done an iconic and incredible trailblazing thing in international airlines. But it does mean that now, apart from those handful of 7879s, this is going to be an Airbus airline. What's also significant is this is the route that Qantas has gone down. And one of the, I'm rambling now, I do apologize. One of the reasons they went this is because Jetstar also has an order for a lot of Airbuses. But when you look to their rivals, so we're going to have Virgin, who have bought off the top of my head, I think it's 20. I might be wrong. Probably more than that. They have invested in, I think it's 20, 25, 737 Maxes, um, as well as their huge fleet of 737, 800. So Virgin will be an almost entirely Boeing airline. And in fact, they move towards being a Boeing airline after their administration. You have got Bonza, who are going to disrupt the market, and they are coming in with a new fleet of brand new 737 Maxes. And you've also got Rex, who are flying a slightly older fleet, I think mostly or entirely leased 737-800. So we've got Qantas go down the Airbus route. We've got the rest of the industry going down a Boeing route. And it's going to be interesting, I think, to see how that's going to pan out. Um, to give you some kind of context to how many Qantas are buying. So initially, they're getting 20 of each of the two different ones, but they've got an option to purchase a further 94 over 10 years. So this is basically the vast bulk of their domestic fleet will be Airbus. And it was a big, big decision that had worldwide ramifications. Yeah, for sure. And I think, you know, a key part of the puzzle here is that obviously, 
Jetstar being the budget subsidiary of Qantas was already an A320 fleet airline. I think Qantas did note in their sort of decision making that, you know, Airbus was giving them this flexibility to sort of mix and match and move around the fleet across Qantas and Jetstar. And that's a really big selling point, I think, for Airbus. It was probably a a step up that they had over Boeing in that way as well. On top of obviously, I personally think Qantas is a very PR conscious and image conscious airline. And I do think that they might have wanted to stray away from being connected to things such as the Boeing 737 MAX and the, as Adam mentioned, the sort of cultural issues that are within sort of the Boeing structure. But it is a huge point that you know, historically speaking, the A320s have been a part of the Jetstar fleet. I think it is a big bonus to Qantas that they'll have access to sort of, you know, move around their orders uh, as they see fit across Qantas and Jetstar in the future. Uh, Mind you, this is all taking place over the next 20 years. Like this fleet expansion, fleet rejig is is going to be underway over the next few years. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and see only Airbuses with a Qantas livery at the airport. It'll be sort of a slow process. I think for the time being, there'll be a mix and match over the next, um, you know, transition. And then moving forward, uh, we will see Qantas becoming largely an Airbus airline. Uh, It's a huge, it does have huge ramifications. And I think a lot of the incumbent airlines are kind of making a similar decision in this way, the more traditional airlines to shift towards Airbus. That's probably a generalization and I apologize for that, but uh, this is just sort of how I see it. And then you see the new players, the, the ones who've got, who are willing to take the risk in that way of Boeing, like Bonza, and they're the ones making the sort of the more riskier decisions. So it it will be really, really interesting to see how this all develops as Qantas grows its fleet and, and changes out its older aircraft and seeing how, you know, Airbus continues to either, you know, sell itself over to the other incumbent airlines, you know, throughout the world. Wow. Sorry, that I got no. really rambly at the end there. What, I don't what know we're what I was do. saying. <laughs> what we're going to do, because we've had enough of talking about aircraft, it's time to change this up in this podcast. After the break, we're going to be talking about trains. We'll be back in a minute. Oh, boy. Okay, welcome back. So before I go on my long rant about trains, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Australian Aviation YouTube channel. Now, I'm millennial. I'm not like Gen Z like you, Hannah, so I can barely work the internet I much prefer ink and print, but I've been lumbered with this technological revolution. What I'm trying to do, what we're trying to do is resuscitate uh, the half-dead Australian Aviation YouTube channel. So when when the company that now owns Australian Aviation Momentum uh, bought the magazine kind of uh, two years ago, one of the things we've tried to do is put more emphasis on the photography and move away basically from PR stock images of 737s landing on the runway and actually take advantage of the fact we've got all of these great plane spotters, all of these good photographers, and try to make more of that and freshen up the website. Um, now, having won the war of 2D images, we've decided to turn our attention to videos because there's all sorts of great videos um, that our readers, our our listeners have taken. And we want to get them on on our YouTube channel. We want to try and build that up to make it a good thing. So we're going to be kind of dipping our toe in the water over the next few weeks. But if you do have a video you've taken, it might be from an air show. It might be when you were out spotting. It might have just been something you took on your phone that flew overhead that you think would be uh, interesting to us. Uh, Please send it over to media at australianaviation.com.au and we will try to feature them. Uh, if, if it's something particularly newsworthy or related to something that's happened in the news, that is great. But anything you think might be of interest, please send it over. And what we want to try and do is make this kind of Australia's top hub hub, hub for uh, aviation videos. So bear with us. We're kind of dipping our toe in it. I'm trying to work out how to put something up without breaking uh, breaking the thing. I don't even know if it's got a URL. You go on YouTube, you put in Australian Aviation, it comes up. We've updated the logo. So yeah, if you do have a video, send it to her. I don't know when she's giggling. Hannah's giggling. She's like, <laughs> I don't know the internet. Yeah, just, You're giggling. I don't know a I'm URL. Old. I'm too I'm old. old to know the I don't internet. Know. <laughs> I don't, I don't, if it's up to me, up to me, I'm going to get fired for this. I don't care. We turn off the internet. We just go back to it in, in ink and print, but sadly we're not allowed to. Apparently there is actually, <laughs> there is actually somewhere in the UK, like under the water, there's some place where you can just like chop away and like cut off the internet. There's like a button you can press and it all just goes down and we all go back to print and the world's a lot happier, but sadly we can't do that we have to embrace the future unfortunately we are to, not. unfortunately yeah 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fine in my day. We, we watched TV, we had a schedule, we sat down, we recorded things on a VHS. Times were simpler, but times were better. Aww. Unfortunately, we have Showing to embrace your age it. There, wow, well, that's just how it is. <laughs> anyway, but if you do have a video, or if you, it doesn't matter if you could send us the video, or if it's on another YouTube channel or whatever they are, send us the information. We'll get it up on our one. We'll give you a credit and stuff. We, 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 you know, we'll give you a plug and put all the information on there. But please send them over. We are trying to get this going. Anyway, enough about aeroplanes. Who cares about aircraft? It's time to talk about the next big thing, which is trains. So, um, <laughs> Australian sto- aviation turns into Australian, Australian, what would it be? Australian rail news or something. Choo, choo, choo. Choo, choo. The controller is here. <laughs> so, over Christmas, Anthony Albanese, the, uh, Albanese, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Labour Party, um, floated the idea kind of pre election that he wants to be the man and, and, and Labour wants to be the party to finally get going on this kind of much talked about. East Coast high speed rail line. So initially it would run from Sydney to Newcastle and it would be like a faster service that would, I think, cut times from two hours, 45 minutes to two hours. But then ultimately it would it would move up to being a kind of Japan style bullet train that would run it 45 minutes. But that would be the start of a long high speed train link that would run from Brisbane to Melbourne. Now, having spoken to many Aussies, and I do have to speak to them sometimes, they tell me (laughs) that this is a story as old as the hills, that they've been talking about this legendary rail link for years and years and years. And it's always been talked of in aviation because what we would talk of is the Golden Triangle. So this is uh, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. This is essentially the most lucrative domestic air link in the world by a long way. So the um, just alone... Qantas's service from Sydney to Melbourne is the second highest revenue generator um, of any service in the world, second only to British Airways, London, Heathrow, to New York, JFK. But when you actually inca- when you put all the bits of the Golden Triangle together, it's incredibly lucrative. And one of the reasons it's lucrative is it's not really practical or cost effective to get anywhere by train. So, you know, the kind of tyranny distance is what makes it so, uh, what makes it generate so much money. And the whispers forever and ever and ever have been one day they will sort out a bullet train and then your, a- your domestic aviation's in a lot of trouble, isn't it? Eh? You and your aeroplanes, let's bring in some trains. So, <laughs> Albanese has pre election basically said, We're going to stop talking about this as something in the future and we're going to get working on this. I'm very sceptical. So obviously Mm. I've been in I'm five and a bit years I've been here, but I did a bit of research and I found out, and this may not be new to anybody here, that when uh, Kevin Rudd was Labour leader, so this was back in 2013, I believe, he basically went in, um, I don't know if it was like an investigation, he commissioned a big study into the feasibility of this high-speed train link and what he came back and said so he calculated that it would cost 114 billion dollars to make so bear in mind that was like nearly 10 years ago that's probably what 150 billion in today's money and some of the feasibility studies came back and said it would take like 40 years to build now if you were i spent i disappeared down a rabbit hole on like boxing day on this it's a waste of my time i don't know anyway I was looking at the newfangled like bullet trains in Tokyo and how quick they are. So I worked it out that essentially um, the latest N700 bullet trains have a speed capped practically at 285 kilometers an hour. So doing some Google Maps research, I reckoned or I worked it out that they could do Sydney to Melbourne if it were all to work perfectly in a rail time of just over two and a half hours. So it would be significantly more than flying now. Now, whether it would be cheaper, who knows? The problem is, if this thing is going to take decades to build, by the time we've built it, we will be flying around an electric aircraft or we'll be on sustainable aviation fuel. And the whole concept of having a bullet train simply will be a thing of the past. So Mm -hmm. my argument is, even though it's a good election promise, we're going to get the bullet trains, Firstly, even if it all went to plan, it would take longer than flying, probably cost a fortune. And even if we get there, 
again, that technology will be teleporting by that point. <laughs> so it, it, even though a bullet train sounds like an exciting idea, you've got to understand that Japan relatively is a, is a smaller country than Australia. It makes sense to work it there. Nonetheless, though, it's put the frighteners on. I personally think we look into it. It's madness. Bullet trains simply will not work. Hannah, dig me out of this rambling hole I'm making myself get into. I, I loved that. That was the like a personal brand. essay yes. compiled by Adam Thorne. Very impressive. You've clearly done your research. It is every time this comes up, you know, this has genuinely been going on since I was a, a child. <laughs> every election, somebody brings up the high-speed rail. I I don't know. It, it drives me mad because it's never going to happen. I, I, I just don't see it happening. I get what Albanese is saying. But we all know it's an election promise and then it just goes nowhere. I don't even know if anybody wants the high-speed rail anymore. Do we care anymore? Has it just been brought up too many times and everybody's over it? As you say, if it's genuinely going to take 40 years, by that time, realistically, the only sort of benefit to it would be lower emissions than flying somewhere, right? As you said, it's also, you know, takes longer to get there. I guess it is, you know, flying is a whole ordeal. It is expensive. I assume, you know, bullet train or whatever the equivalent is would be uh, somewhat cheaper perhaps. But at the same time, yeah, again, like to me, the, the biggest appeal is efficiency. But in 40 or 50 years' time, who knows what aircraft are going to be able to do, what batteries are going to be able to do, will everything be electric, will it be hybrid, will whatever, we don't know. But the thing is, it's just never going to happen. It comes up every time. It's so annoying because we just don't have, we have a three-year election term. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't make sense. Nobody's going to actually put in the hard yards just for somebody else to come in three years later and all of a sudden it's a Liberal government again and they're going to take over and they're probably going to pull it to shreds because they hate everything Labor does and vice versa. Labor would just pull everything else that was planned by a Liberal, a liberal government to shreds because they just don't like getting along or agreeing that the other one is right or that they've made a good plan or whatever. So it just doesn't happen. I can't see it actually being feasible and I can't see it actually happening. It would be trying to get it back on the aviation frame of mind. It definitely would be a disruptor, I suppose, to the aviation industry in that it would sort of take the place of those more lucrative high uh, frequency routes but at the same time, Australia's aviation industry is so vital to the country because of just how big we are. As you said, we're not Japan. We're not that little. There's way, there's so many uh, sort of ports and, and places that need to be connected that aviation is just so vital to our country, to our industries. So, you know, it, it, it would definitely be a, be a spanner in the works if it ever actually happens. <laughs> And the other thing, the other madness of this is now you've obviously got Western Sydney Airport, which is being built at the moment. We've had a new runway open up at Brisbane. Now, yes, they are international runways. But the point is that it frees up slots potentially to do more domestic travel. So the idea we've thrown all these money at upgrading Brisbane, building a major new airport in New South Wales. Oh, actually, we're going to we're going to throw it all on trains. It doesn't seem like it's going to it's going to work that well. And also, I should say I'm quite apolitical. I'm not I'm not going in on on Labour here, but. In order to build this, you're going to have to buy up an enormous amount of land. That's going to be going through a lot of people's homes or it's going to be going through a lot of fields, you know, all of that. I mean, this thing would be gigantic. It would surely be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, train on in the world. Can you imagine all the kind of disasters that would pop up? I, I kind of feel that even though it sounds good when you look into it, it just won't work. And I also just feel that the world is moving on. If we're not teleporting, we will be. It will be electric aircraft. Like that's where mm. transport is going. And the idea that in 2022, talking about what we're going to have in 2060, we're talking about trains, is to fundamentally misunderstand the way I'm ranting now, and I don't care, to fundamentally misunderstand the way the industry is going. Rant over. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you there. And I think, you know, we also, when you look at like how many issues we've had with with existing trains in Sydney in particular, it just, it, it seems like, come on, there has to be a better election promise. Get something else to get people excited. Get something else, you know, going to, to ramp, ramp up those votes. I'm sure it won't be that difficult. There's got to be, I think you can just like cast your eyes into the future. I don't know. I'm not a politician, but electric aircraft for sure, I think that would get people uh, to support 
I think anything that's uh, lowering emissions but increasing efficiencies, that's going to get support. Get over high-speed rail. It's just, it's not going to happen. We're not going to catch a train from Melbourne to Brisbane. It's not going to happen in my lifetime. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> do you reckon I don't, I don't know and i simply don't care if there is like an, if, if there's like an australian trains magazine or whatever like i don't care but i can imagine <laughs> us having a kind of like greece style dance off with them or like a kind of you know some kind of way to sort our difference because there might be somebody there might be an equivalent of me and you on the Australian Trains podcast, and they're going, you know what? <laughs> it, let's get this thing built. We've had enough of that. Let's choo choo. Let's steam into the rails. <laughs> let's choo choo. Um, if you oh. do happen to be uh, a writer or editor of Australian Trains magazine, do let us know. Where have you on the podcast? I don't care. Let's get them on the podcast. Let's win this argument, is what I say. <laughs> yeah. Silence. All right. Silence. Sure, go on for that it. note, let's on, get as, back to, yeah. to planes, should we? <laughs> as as the as this as this now descends into farce, I will cut our losses and end the podcast. Okay. There. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're giggling away. Hannah, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be back on the Australian Aviation Podcast. I love it here. It's great. You love it here. Exactly. Why would you want to buy a ticket for a train when we can fly in the air? Um, Thank you all very much for joining us. Remember, if you do have any videos, if they're on YouTube, if they're on a floppy disk, a a mini disk, I don't care what it is, media at australianaviation.com.au. Send them over and we will rebuild Um, our video offering Uh, but for now we will be back at the same time next week at goodbye